conference, I have to confess that I was both delighted and surprised when the Prime Minister appointed me in this role. I was delighted because I love the countryside. I represent one of the most productive agricultural areas of the country in the fine county of Norfolk. I see some of them in the audience, and I am infatuated with British food. But I was surprised to be appointed because of what I have in common with Ed Miliband. We both grew up in left-wing households. We both have parents who are academics. His father talked about Marx and Trotsky over the dinner table. My mother took me on protests. I went on marches. I made banners. I stayed at peace camps. For me, it wasn't ballet or my little pony. It was saving the planet and the CND. The most useful thing I learned was how to make myself heard in a crowd. And I haven't forgotten that lesson to this day. But while Ed stayed with the predictable left-wing establishment, I conference rebelled. I became a conservative. And there are three reasons I rebelled. I believed that we can shape our own destiny. I believe that people should succeed on merit. And as a practical Yorkshire girl, I believe that rather than talking, we should be about getting things done. And when it comes to the environment, the Labour Party have always been good at talking. But it's Conservatives who've been good at doing. It was a Conservative who pointed out that CFCs were damaging the ozone layer. It was a Conservative who championed international efforts to ban them. It was a Conservative who signed the treaty phasing out their youth, use. And the name of that Conservative is Margaret Thatcher. The ozone layer is now getting better, and we're leading international efforts to tackle climate change. We've cleaned up almost 10,000 miles of rivers and our beaches. The number of important birds like the linnet and the goldfinch are on the rise. We're planting a million trees and 20,000 acres of woodland. Our defenses against flooding are being upgraded to make them more robust. We are spending 3.2 billion on flood defences, half a billion more than the previous government, which is better protecting 165,000 homes and over 580,000 acres of farmland. We are vigilant about the threats that we face. All that means that families can enjoy clean rivers, and clean beaches. It means that they can have peace of mind in their own homes, while children will hear the sound of birdsong in our meadows and our woodland. <clears throat> Conference. This is not about targets and turbines. This is about practical conservative environmentalism, where a strong, healthy environment is part of a strong, healthy economy and our long-term economic plan.
This is just what our farmers and our food producers need. There was once a time when our country was in decline and our food was in decline. We had an inferiority complex about some of our fantastic British dishes. We'd lost pride in our country and we'd lost pride in our food. The amount of British food we consumed and produced went down. And the last Labour government tied our farmers up in red tape. They wasted £600 million on fines to the EU and they left us with the worst bovine TB problem in Europe. The fact is, Labour do not care about the countryside. They think we can't grow enough of our own food. They think it's fine to outsource it. Well, they are wrong. <laughs> Decline is not inevitable. Under this government, food and farming is actually a huge success. It's one of our biggest success stories. Food is our largest manufacturing industry. It's bigger than aerospace and car production put together. Modern farming is not about shire horses and steam engines. It's about systems and satellites. At every stage in the supply chain, we've got cutting edge technology. We've got GPS in tractors. We've got automated celery rigs. We have organizations like Sainsbury's with an army of coders. That's probably why food is one of the fastest growing areas for entrepreneurs. And we're helping producers compete by slashing red tape and opening up public procurement, as well as opening up almost 600 new markets overseas, thanks to the hard work of my predecessors, Owen Patterson and Caroline Spellman. Exports have increased by more than a billion pounds over the past four years and the results are superb. They are absolutely superb. We are growing wheat more competitively than the Canadian prairies. We're producing more varieties of cheese than the French. And we are selling tea to China. <laughs> Yorkshire tea. <laughs> when it comes to British food and drink, we have never had it so good. <laughs> but as well as exporting our fantastic food abroad, I want to see us eating more British food here in Britain. At the moment, we import two thirds of all of our apples. We import nine tenths of all of our pears. We import two thirds of our cheese. That is a disgrace. From the apples that dropped on Isaac Newton's head to the orchards of nursery rhymes, this fruit has always been part of Britain. It's been part of our country. I want our children to grow up knowing the taste of a British apple, of Cornish sardines, of Herefordshire pears, of Norfolk turkey, of Melton Mowbray pork pies, and of course, of black pudding. Yeah. Under a conservative government, Britain will lead the world in food, farming and the environment. In a fortnight, 
I'm going to Paris for the world's largest food trade fair, and I will be bigging up British products. In December, I'll be in Beijing, opening up new pork markets. I am determined that our producers will have access to more markets, both home and abroad, generating jobs and security for millions. I'm determined to press ahead, restoring habitats, cleaning rivers, and improving our atmosphere so that future generations can enjoy clean air and enjoy the countryside. I'm determined that our flood defences will always be strong enough to protect us from the ravages of a changing climate. And I will not rest until the British apple is back at the top of the tree. Thank you.